All right, welcome back to TNK Sports Talk. My name is Thomas. I'm Kevin. And we are joined by a very special guest today, uh, Jordan Verde Verde, uh, former Philadelphia Eagle. Thanks for coming on. Hi, Jordan. guys. Oh, my pleasure. You have to forgive me. I'm getting blasted by the, the evening sun here, so I look like I'm glowing. But uh, don't worry, it's, it's not radiation. I am perfectly fine. All right, good to know. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, Julian, just want to get to know you a little bit here for, for our listeners. We understand that you were drafted in 2011 in the same draft that both Jason Kelsey and Danny Watkins were in. Just right. how was that whole process like, being invited to the Combine, participating in a pro day, and just that whole process? I'm sure it's insane. It's a lot of, it's, a, it's crazy, but it's a lot of fun at the same time. You really, um, you know, you, you get a lot of prep for it uh, from the guys who kind of come before you. Um, you know, I was at the University of Iowa, which is, uh, you know, one of the more prolific offensive line schools. So we kind of had a lot of guys who would uh, hang around or would come back, uh, you know, from the league from years prior. Um, and so you, you had a lot of people that you could kind of lean on uh, who would give you their perspective. Uh, on things and kind of talk you through, okay, this is how the, the combine works. So it's not so much of a surprise for you. Um, you know, your agents telling you stuff, uh, you know, the whole time about kind of the way that the process works as well. So your, your support network around you, you got to have a lot of people who are, uh, who are very knowledgeable about the process um, because you don't want to be caught off guard by any part of it. Uh, right. Part of the, the whole thing is presenting yourself, uh, you know, in this way that makes you desirable to these teams uh, you know, not just at the at the combine, but at your pro day and at individual workouts, and when you you know when teams fly out to places to to visit. Um, so being able to prepare for all of that kind of in the same vein that you would uh, prepare for any other game is uh, is really important. Um, and I was very fortunate to be in a position to be able to do that. Awesome. Then, uh, so you were at University of Iowa. Uh, you also played with a couple guys there. Um, that made the league about the same time you did, and um, like Brian Beluga and Adrian Claiborne. I'm sure, those guys were able to kind of help you out along the way too. Yeah, playing with them is it was you know tremendous. Um, you know the fact that those guys were uh, those were the kind of guys you had to go against in practice every day, right? Guys like Mike Daniels and Carl and you know, play born and playing next to excuse me my two-year-olds hitting me with the field. Um, <laughs> play next to guys uh you know who also that guys like Brian Blog and uh you know James Ferris and uh you know Adam Geddes all these other guys who you know had uh had you know lengthy careers uh, some of whom were still in the league um, was a tremendous benefit um and uh and yeah like I said having those guys to go against every day um, and then also having those guys to lean on in terms of uh, in terms of coming out of college and what's it like that transition to the league um, was really beneficial for me. Yeah, because like like you said, combine you really have to present yourself when it comes to showing yourself out to become a market with these teams to be in a position to get drafted. And as mm -hmm. a day three guy, you were drafted in the fifth round. What, what's it like watching the draft those first couple of days? And like, did you have kind of an idea on where you were going to, to land in terms of which round? Did you have kind of a narrowed down teams that had a interest in you saying, like, if you're here at this point in time, we're going to consider picking you? Or how does that whole projection work when you're meeting with these teams? Yeah, you, you have some idea. Um, you know, your agent's in constant communication with you, so they're kind of letting you know. Uh, along the way, and you, you do get a feel. And for me, being a, being a guy who I knew I was going to be mid to late rounds, um, you know, that was a, a situation where, like, that first day of the draft, you're just kind of watching your teammates, right? You're watching, you're you're watching four guys like Adrian and going, all right, you know, like I think he's going this round, and you're you know kind of cheering on your guys. Um, but uh, you know, you get into that second day, and you get into that third day, and you start, you know, the second day, it's like okay, if somebody takes a reach, right, like you have to have your phone on you because like I didn't expect to call that day. But it's like you want your phone next to you because if somebody does call, if somebody has you high evaluated higher than you think, um, then you want to be ready for that. Uh, but going into day three was really, uh, you know, I had, I had a good idea 
um, that, uh, you know, of kind of the rounds that, uh, that we were looking at, kind of that fifth, sixth round area. Uh, and we also knew the teams that were, that were interested. And that's where your agent can really help you out is letting you know kind of this list of, you know, I've been in contact with these teams. Uh, you know, these ones have shown interest. And, you know, realistically, like some of them are just playing politics. Some of them will say that they're interested in somebody to try and, you know, get another team off their trails. So they don't pick the guy that they want. And there's all these like, you know, crazy games that they're playing in the back rooms. Um, but you have a pretty good idea of the three or four teams. And for me, it was interesting because uh, four of the teams that we knew were interested in me were picking back to back to back to back. So there was this block where my agent basically, like, at the beginning of the day, we kind of planned out that whole, you know, how that day was going to go and looked at the draft order of everybody. And we had basically identified this block in the fifth round where it was like, okay, if you're going to go, this is where it's most likely that you're going to go is in these picks. Um, you know, so that was just kind of the whole day was kind of a lead up to that. Uh, and uh, that wound up being uh, the case for me. Um, you know, the, the Philly was one of those teams. Alondra, will you please go get that marker from your brother? The joys of children. Ellie Belly, can you go get that marker from your brother, please? Or see if he's drawn on the whiteboard. <laughs> yeah, because because uh, you got drafted by Philly. Uh, whenever um, you had that initial phone call, um, I'm sure you talked to um, Andy Reid. What was your kind of like first impression meeting him and um, everything? Andy, Andy's a legend, man. Um, and even then, he was a guy who. Uh, you know, the I, I, I didn't kind of know his situation with Philly and what was going on there kind of at the end of his tenure there, uh, you know, at the time. But uh, but I knew of him and obviously, you know, his, he's a prolific coach, you know, multiple playoff appearances and, and the whole – I grew up a Packer fan, so, like, that staff of, like, Holmgren and stuff was uh, okay. you know, keeping track of those guys. Um, you know, so I, I knew of him, um, you know, and I kind of knew his pedigree and, uh, and his reputation. Um, so I thought it was going to be a good scenario, plus Juan Castillo at the time, uh, you know, who had just uh, transitioned over from being the offensive line coach to the defensive coordinator. Uh, I played with uh, with his son, Greg, at Iowa. Um, so okay. I'd known Juan for a while, um, you know, knew him pretty well. Uh, and I had met Howard Mudd when Philly flew me out for a visit. Um, so, like, I had kind of all these connections within the, within the program already. Um, so it was a really easy kind of transition for me to, to come in that first year. Yeah, because right now we see more than ever how important these rookie mini camps are. But how important is it for an offensive lineman that's coming in? Like because you know you see guys like Devontae Smith that's that just got recently drafted by Philadelphia. You see him in videos. He's catching footballs. He's running routes. What's probably the biggest difference between a special wide receiver like a skill position wide receiver running back quarterback versus offensive line because that's got to be a totally different scenario for only going up against rookies at that time and not being able to be around the, the veterans until OTAs and mandatory mini camps begin yeah yeah and we actually had a very very strange situation because it was during uh it was during the labor dispute so there was no, there was no rookie mini camp. There was no summer program. Uh, they were, they were doing the, um, um, whatever the, it was, the, uh, uh, the union stuff, right at the time. Um, so the collective bargain. So the collective bargaining yes. was going on. Uh, so no, no one could officially meet. Uh, so basically, we would just have these informal get-togethers where those of us who, you know, I got drafted, and then I think, uh, you know, a couple of days later, uh, drove out to Philly. And the veterans were kind of organizing these, these informal workouts in parks, uh, you know, where all sorts of people would show up, like people who weren't even on the roster. There was a guy uh, who came who, um, who was from Philadelphia, uh, and he played at like Temple or something, but he played in the CFL. Uh, and he came down, uh, you know, from Canada and was playing, and was, uh, you know, having these practices with us, um, you know, in the park. And it was just kind of a lot of, uh, of, of, of veteran led workouts. Uh, and again, I was extremely fortunate. This is, this was all kind of serendipitous, but uh, Austin Howard uh, was a year ahead of me and he went to my high school. So my high schools had like a total of three or four guys 
ever to come out of it and go to the NFL. It was like Roger Craig. Uh, and then there was like a 30 year gap. And then me and Austin Howard, um, <laughs> So Howard was a year ahead of me. And so he had been, he spent a, a, a season with the Eagles before he went on. I think he had an eight year career, ended up starting um, as a tackle for, uh, for the Raiders and uh, the Colts and some other teams, uh, the Ravens, but, um, but he was there. And so I knew him really, really well, because we had been on the same team together for three years in high school. So when the vets were organizing these workouts, he was calling me like, Hey, you need to be at these, you know, be at this place at this time, um, you know, for these workouts. Uh, and it gave me a little bit, uh, you know, more of a, of comfort with the team and with the personnel by the time we actually got to, uh, to get to playing again. Yeah. Just that whole situation was bizarre with the CBA and there, it, there was a point for a couple of months where it looked like the season was going to get canceled altogether, which would really ruined the, the whole experience for everything. Because I mean, that was like, here we are again, just last year in the COVID situation, like almost the same thing. So a lot of these rookies last year, you see a lot of these quarterbacks struggle early and a lot of these skill possession players struggle because there, there were no camps. And, mm -hmm. and compared to the 2011 year, at least you were able to get together, but in a total pandemic, you know, you weren't able to really do anything. You weren't able to get together with anybody. Yeah. I can't imagine trying to be one of those guys and trying to get, get ready for, I mean, the jump from, from, college to the NFL is so extreme like the you know the, it's you every single practice and every single game you are going up against borderline superheroes guys who are the best dude that you ever played against in college that's everybody now so like to have to not have that prep time for those guys because of COVID for a lot of them to just come in and, and out of the gates, the change in speed and the change in scheme and everything, um, I, I do not envy them for that. Um, you know, it was hard enough with the CBA going on, uh, but we at least could, you know, get together and talk. Uh, you know, those guys, shoot, you couldn't have more than, uh, you couldn't have an entire offensive line room in a room together, uh, you know, at the same time. Uh, so it would have been very tough. Yeah. So I'm curious, you said about how, uh, in the league, obviously, you go up against everybody who's, you know, some of the best at what they do and everything. That's why they're in the league. Uh, in your time in the NFL, who was the toughest um, opponent that you went up against? Like, all week, you were just like, man, I don't, it's going to be tough, you know, blocking this guy. I was fortunate in that uh, I was a uh, career backup. <laughs> so I never really had a guy who uh who it was like I knew I was gonna you know have to go against so and so or whatever like I played against JJ Watt in college um you know there's you know there's that caliber of guys that you play against in college so for a lot of that it's not so much that okay this you know I, I have to worry about this guy for an entire game especially when you're backup like you do your film study and you're ready for those guys um but you know that the odds of you actually playing against them is relatively small uh, you know, what, what was difficult for us was every day giving a good look to the guys that were starting, right? Like Fletcher Cox comes in and he's, you know, whatever he is, 6'6", six, six with a 10-foot wingspan and can, you know, back out since like, if he's a, you know, it's, it's, it's literally a superhuman standing here in front of you. And I'm, you know, this fat kid from Davenport, Iowa, who's just out here trying to rely on technique and quickness. And like, he just picked me up by the shoulders and moved me if he wants to. So like going into practice every day and be like, I have to give this guy as good a look or better as he is going to see in the game. He's ready for that. Like that's, that's where you really kind of hung your hat and took a lot of pride in, uh, in what you were doing. Yeah, Fletcher cut towards an animal when he came out. Um, when you came, when you got drafted too, you came into an offensive line that um, had guys on it already, like Jason Peters and Evan Mathis and like Todd Harriman's. Um, did any of those guys ever like? Um, I'm sure they helped out showing you stuff like, uh, hey, you know, it's good to do this against this or did the, any of them really help you out with what you did 
Well, they all did. And I know that was one thing that I think was very different about that offensive line room is you would hear horror stories coming out during the draft and during the, the NFL prep process um, of guys uh, getting into situations where like you'd walk into an offensive line room or you'd walk into, you know, whatever position room it was and, and nobody would help you. And guys would be actively sabotaging because it's like, okay, there's, you know, you come into, into, you know, mini camps with whatever 15 people in this room you know that seven or eight people are staying and seven or eight people are leaving. And maybe three of them are going to come back uh, as, uh, you know, for practice squad, but that's it. Uh, so everybody else is fighting for a position and they're fighting for their, for their job. And you as a young guy, you're coming in and your goal is to take someone else's job, right? That's their livelihood that you're trying to take away um, so that you can provide for your family. And so that's, so you would hear these stories of guys who would just who would actively sabotage new guys because they didn't want them to come and, ta- and take their spot and replace them. Uh, and that room was filled with such awesome dudes um, who who were so team oriented and so focused on on helping each other and helping everybody else. Uh, you know, Todd was incredible. Uh, you know, from day one, uh, was just a real mentor and a guy that, uh, you know, that really latched onto you and, and would teach anybody anything. Uh, Jason Peters, if he never played another down and they just kept him in that locker room to be a mentor to the young guys, he would, uh, you know, he'd be worth his weight in gold um, because of everything that he's able to teach everyone who comes in. Uh, you know, it's like having two or three different offensive line coaches in that room with those guys in there. Uh, you know, Jamal uh, Jackson stepping up and, you know, knowing that Jason Kelsey was there to replace him uh, and still putting forth everything that he did and helping Jason and teaching him and coaching him. Like, they were just an incredible room of guys uh, to be around. Yeah, you, you touched on Jason Kelsey. You had two different stints with Philadelphia, one in 2011 when you were drafted and then starting again in 2012 through 2000. Was there any sort of just slipped. And, <laughs> was there any sort of an it's immediate like character change that you saw in Jason Kelsey from his so rookie year slipped. towards the middle and of the your season? Like, oh, in for sure. Oh yeah, Kelsey was a completely different person. Um, <laughs> for a second, so I can get this kid a, a, a pacifier and something cold to chew. I know my kids. Um, so yeah, Jason Kelsey was a dude who just, oh, my camera just cut out. Uh, when he got in, and we were all just kind of trying to survive. Uh, like there was no, there was no practice, there was no OTAs. Uh, you know, it was just coming in and swinging for the thing you had. Uh, and so, you know, he was a quieter guy that year. Um, went around, did his job, uh, and that was about it. By the time that third and fourth year rolled around, I mean, he just completely came out of his shell. Totally different guy. Uh, that's the Jason Kelsey that you see today, right? The one who who dressed up in a mummer's outfit after, the- <laughs> and, you know, and gave that great speech and saying, you know, no one likes us, we don't care. Like, that's the Jason Kelsey that that kind of developed uh, over those first two years. But I think that's who he really is, uh, you know. But he knew coming in, especially he had he probably should have gone much higher in the draft. Um, but I think he had, he'd gotten like mono or had, uh, something like that where he had lost a bunch of weight and couldn't, uh, and couldn't really participate coming into the draft. And so he fell a little bit, um, you know, but he's, he's been an animal since day one on the field. You know, that same level of effort and intensity has always been there, uh, once he straps up the pads. <laughs> Go ahead, Thomas, if you want to touch on more Jason Kelsey if you want to. I mean, Jason's just the man. There's not much else to say about him. You know, yeah. He's, he's a leader, and uh, and you can't you can't have enough guys like that. Uh, you know, who come in every day and give the kind of effort that he gives. Um, so I, I mean, they they just absolutely hit a freaking home run with that one. And he was drafted after me. Dude just came in and and hungry from day one, man. Yeah. Hey, going from what you were saying about how important like leadership is, and I know you were saying earlier about um, how Andy Reid was just the man and um, was great in that locker room and everything. What was it like uh, in your second stint in Philly? Uh, 
having Chip Kelly, what was the major differences having him around other than having a guy like Andy Reid? I mean, you can't even, the, the list is too long. Uh, yeah. They were polar opposites. I always, uh, you know, I talk about Andy as, uh, as the consummate players coach where he was, his mentality and his staff's mentality was really, you guys are professionals. You know what it took to get you here. You know how to take care of your bodies, right? You've been doing this for years. So like, you know, the weight room was open for certain times, but you just had to come in and, you know, like get an hour long workout or something, you know, three days a week. And, uh, you know, the rookies had a little bit tighter leash, but not much, Um, you know, but he was very much so like, Hey, you guys know what you need to do. Um, And if you don't know, we'll find someone to replace you who does. Um, And so he put a lot of onus on the players. Chip was a college coach. Um, You know, he was a college coach. He was a micromanager. He was a science guy. He was a numbers guy. So everything to him came down to reports and stats and figures and nitpicky stuff, right? He wanted to control every single aspect uh, of who you are and and what you were doing. Um, He wanted to know, you know, your heart rate at every practice. He wanted to know your, uh, you know, the top speed that you reached while you were on the field. Uh, You know, every single morning, uh, everyone had to come in and like pee in a cup by 6 a.m. Because he wanted to check the pH levels in guys' urine to see how hydrated they were. Like at the beginning of the day, like the littlest things. Um, And it really, really rubbed on a lot of the veterans uh, in a way, no thank you, uh, in a way that they did not like. And I think you kind of saw that as his tenure went on, uh, right, and the tension kind of grew in that locker room, um, that that style really was not jiving um, with that, with that team, especially, which was a very veteran team. Yeah, because you, you were playing with the Eagles when they had the one of the most dynamic offenses that Philadelphia ever had with, with Michael Vick, LaShawn, Deshaun Jackson, Jeremy Macklin, Brent Selleck when he was in his prime. Have veteran guys like that and have a college coach telling them to do that. Do you think that's what kind of started the demise of that team? Because a lot of people feel like if that team had stayed together, it was a matter of time before they brought home a championship. I mean, Chip Kelly let go of Deshaun Jackson because of potential – past problems when he was living in California and the whole Riley Cooper situation and he ended up staying on the team. Do you think that was the beginning of the demise in 2014 when all that started happening? Yeah, I think the micromanagement had a lot to do with it. Um, It was, you could, you know, there were ways around some of that stuff um, and veterans found them. Uh, Here's the thing about the NFL. Guys have money and they have time. So you can't BS anyone because they will absolutely find out. Um, and I think the biggest thing, there were two things that really, that really hurt, uh, you know, kind of chip in that whole, uh, in that tenure and that staff. And the first one was the micromanagement. And the best example I can say about that in terms of he lost trust with the team because he didn't give anyone any trust. Um, and so like with the urine thing, he said that they like had a team meeting. And they told everybody in this team meeting that they have, you know, like, this is the, you know, the urine stick that you guys see us use every day to check your urine. Like, it can tell, you know, not just the pH, it can tell what you were drinking the night before, right? It can tell your, uh, you know, the you know, the level of your sodium and this thing and that thing's like, we can tell if you've been drinking Gatorade or you've been drinking beer, all this other stuff. Well, guys with time and money went out and researched it and found those sticks, those same ones and uh, bought them and like talked to their doctors and stuff. Uh, and all of that was BS. All it could do was tell you the pH uh, level of your urine, that was it. And so there was just this instant separation between like the sports science department and the players uh, over the fact that they had effectively been lying to the players this whole time and exaggerating this ultimately meaningless sort of ritual that took place every morning. Uh, and so that just further separated the trust. Uh, and then the other part was just a lack of flexibility, I think. Um, you know, there were there were guys in that locker room who had been playing football longer than Chip had been coaching. And the guys had been playing in the league for, you know, going on a decade uh, and knew the offenses and the defenses, knew the systems, knew the referees, uh, you know, by on a first name basis and knew what worked and knew what didn't. And there were parts of that offense that were that worked in college that were never going to work in the NFL. Uh, especially without a... You cut out, I think. Oh, can you still hear me? 
Can you hear me now? Can you I hear can him, see. Kevin? Yeah, I can see you and hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep, I got you. Okay, it's back? Okay, sweet. So, yeah, but there were parts of that offense that were never really going to work in the NFL, especially not without a quarterback who, who could run like a 4-4 like Mike, right? So once you kind of lost that element of it, there were some adjustments made, but not enough. Uh, and so you wound up with a playbook that was, you know, this thick as opposed to the encyclopedia that a lot of guys have. And the goal here was, hey, we're going to run, you know, a play every, you know, it was like seven to ten seconds or something. And in college, you could get away with that. In the NFL, the referees, when Chip was trying to hustle the referees along, they just kind of look at him like he was crazy and be like, we're going to do this on our pace, buddy. And like, you know, place the ball more slowly and let the defense get set. And just kind of like, you couldn't push anybody. Uh, you know, the up-tempo style was good in spurts, but for a whole game, uh, the offense was too simplistic. And, uh, and, you and it never fully got off the ground again after Mike got hurt. Uh, and so that really kind of stymied him. Uh, and I think that going that listening to some of the vets about some of the changes that could have been made a little bit more uh, would have helped uh, make that offense more multiple uh, and might might have extended his uh, his tenure a little bit more. Yeah, because you mentioned Mike Vick being the mobile quarterback that he was being able to run the Chip Kelly offense. What I always found interesting, even looking back now, is that Michael Vick in 2013, Chip Kelly's debut season. The team was, I think it was two and four going into MetLife Stadium against New York. Michael Vick pulls his hamstring and in comes Nick Foles and he takes over for pretty much the remainder of the season. But it seemed like, judging by how the offense looked with Michael Vick compared to Nick Foles, like everybody knows Nick Foles had the incredible touchdown ratio of 27 touchdowns to only two interceptions. Mm -hmm. What did that do to that offense where it's designed for a mobile quarterback but Nick Foles is a strong-armed athlete where he can't really do much with his legs. I mean, he can if he chooses to, but he's not going to outrun anybody. That's why yeah. I always <laughs> it definitely It definitely changed that offense. Um, and I think that the, the big part of it is that, like, the, the read scheme um, in the pros, like, when your defensive ends run four fives, it's very, very difficult to run a, a read, like a true, just, you know, read offense uh, where that's, that's all you're doing is you're, you know, you're reading the defensive end and there were some wrinkles, right? There was reading backside linebackers for throws that came in when Nick was around, uh, you know, you'd read defensive tackles instead uh, of that, you'd have, you know, tight ends slice to the backside and pick off the end man on the line of scrimmage. So there, it forced a little bit more variance, I think, in the style. Uh, and it created a more pro style feel because you had to rely on, you couldn't rely on the, on the read option. You couldn't, you know, you had to get more creative than that with the route concepts um, and with the, uh, with the style of play that you were playing. Um, so the normal play calling that I think Chip was so very used to, he had to make an adjustment there. Um, and, uh, and Nick is just a guy who, I mean, first of all, I love Nick to death. Uh, you know, he's genuine, he's real, he's exactly what you see, uh, you know, out of him all the time. Um, so he had a very different demeanor about him, um, and a very different sort of attitude. Uh, and obviously, that skill set uh, played better into kind of the style that Chip's offense was being forced to adapt to uh, when it moved into the NFL. I think you guys with me again. I'm sorry. Normally, my two-year-old just sits and hangs out when I'm doing something, and right now he's very upset that his mother is not here. Oh, it's not a problem. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> like you man. said about going from a uh, guy like Vic, who you know ran a four-four and you know can move around, you're into a guy like Foles, who's more stationary. Uh, what's the adjustment like going from a quarterback like that um, as an offensive lineman? Like, do you have to change yours at all, knowing that, like, at any time the guy behind me that I'm trying to block for is just going to take off and run and be in front of me or trying to do your thing and whatever he does, he does? 
So for me, I I was a big fan of having a pocket passer. It was what I was used to. Uh, you know, coming from Iowa, where we have the the that pro style offense. Um, I found it easier knowing where the quarterback was going to be, or at least where he was supposed to be. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong, like Mike can do some incredible things and having an athlete like that who can take off at a moment's notice and, and make huge plays and have huge runs uh, is, is immense um, and can be very, very useful. I don't know that designing the system around that in – uh, in the NFL is, or at least not at that time, could could work as well. Um, you've got an evolution to play calling that kind of takes place over time, and now we have two dozen right, running quarterbacks uh, in the NFL who are capable of doing that, um, just taking off at a moment's notice and running. But I don't think you really see uh, playbooks that are designed around that, right? That are designed for a, a minus one system where you're uh, where you're taking one defender and assigning him to the quarterback and saying, okay, this is your guy. It's more so we're going to have a playbook. If shit breaks down, use your legs. Uh, and that was not the the Chip Kelly style was. The Chip Chip's playbook was designed around math, right? And putting yourself in a position where if you were plus one on the front side, the quarterback had to account for the lack of a person on the backside and pull and run. But everyone in the NFL is so fast that they that guys would just make that up. Right? A linebacker who took two steps in the wrong direction, he'd make that ground up in less than half a second. Uh, and suddenly that window that in the college world was this big was only this big in the NFL. And so the plays never really got off the ground. Yeah, you mentioned former players. This is another thing that I often wonder about. You know, you're you're out of the league right now, but what is the relationship like with former teammates? Like, do you still have connections with them? Like, do you still reach out to them? Like, what is what is the contact like? Do you still have a conversation here and there with a former teammate like a Todd Harriman, like a Jason Kelsey, or anywhere else that you had played in in the other league that you were in? Uh, to a certain extent. Um, there's definitely still guys like from my college days that I keep up with very tightly. Um, it's more so you, you get close to people, um, you know, who, who are in a similar situation to you. Um, so whereas like, I don't really have much contact with Jason anymore. You know, I'll, me and Todd will tweet at each other every now and then, or, you know, Jamal or somebody like that. Um, but for the most part, like the guys that I still stay in some semblance of contact with, uh, our guys like Dallas Reynolds and Mike Vomiro, who were other, uh, you know, practice squad guys or, you know, late round picks or, uh, you know, guys who like, you know, was roommates with Mike Vomiro um, and uh, Nate Menken. So, you know, those are the guys that I spent a lot of time with. Um, and so they're the guys that I knew best, then, the guys that I still know best now. He's drawing on the floor and marker. I should probably make that stop. <laughs> mass chaos all the time once you have this is my thing about kids this is my advice for both of you so it's neither neither of you have kids right correct correct okay so never have more kids than parents all right when you have one kid and two parents right it's double coverage you can stack one over the top you know it's really hard for that kid to get away when it's two and two now at least you're in man coverage and everybody's accounted for once there's three of them and two of you, you're in zone coverage all the time, and somebody will always get open eventually in a zone. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> so that's where you got to be really, really careful with these. How many do you have? We have three. Three. Yeah. It's always in the zone. We have an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, a two-year-old. You got no one playing nickel right now. <laughs> Stop. Stop. And this one, the two-year-old is demanding – my attention. It's going to hit me with this fly swatter. I can tell you. Yeah, there it goes. See? <laughs> you can see it in his eyes. I can see it in his eyes. <laughs> uh, digging more that. into dig, digging more into your past, like because it it shows that you are a very well-rounded athlete. Like you were participating in the 2000 Williamsport Little League World Series. Yeah, we see that we see that every summer on ESPN and ABC. How much of a big deal that is to those kids and and the parents like that are there for those kids. Does what's that whole experience like for for us for me and Thomas living in Pennsylvania? Like, 
every year it's such a huge deal. I mean, there was a town, uh, Red, Redland, that won the United States Championship a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And Harrisburg, our local double A affiliate to the Washington Nationals, like threw a parade for them. Like it's a huge, like, like it's a huge deal here in like, especially the Harrisburg area. So mm-hmm. you as a person that participated in that event, what is that whole experience like as a young player taking in that experience where all the eyes are on you, the TV cameras are there as a kid and you're starstruck, I'm sure, no? It was, it was really cool. I think it's way cooler now than it was then which is a weird sort of like for me, it's cooler now than it was then, which is kind of weird. At the time we were just 12 year old kids, right? There was, I mean, we, I hung out in the dorms and read Harry Potter and played, uh, you know, Mario Kart 64 and ping pong with the kids from Japan. Uh, I had a couple of teammates who met a couple of girls who lived there and they would, you know, go around, uh, you know, to the, uh, you know, going on little dates or whatever with these, uh, you know, with these girls from, uh, from Williamsport that they met. Um, you know, for the most part, we were just there to play ball. Um, and we actually, at one point, we got to meet Kevin Costner because of, you know, the movie Field of Dreams and whatnot. And yeah. I, I was so, I had never seen Field of Dreams. I had no idea who this guy was. Like all the parents are, oh, it's Kevin Costner. I'm just like, who is this old guy? Like I had no idea. So for me, it was more like it was cool to be there. But I was, it was cool for me to be there because I got to play more baseball because my season wasn't over and we still got to, you know, got to play. Um, and we recognized that there was some significance to it. Like we were the last uh, teams that did uh, the eight team format before they switched to a 16 team format. Um, so like we got to keep all of our jerseys and stuff, which they said, like, you, normally you get to give those things back at the end and they wash them and they use them for next year. So we got to keep our jerseys and stuff, which is cool. Um, but like now looking back at it at this point in time, it's like, holy crap, I met Kevin Costner and we were on national TV and you know, I hit a home run off of some, you know, tiny kid from New York and stuff like that sort of thing is much cooler now uh, to me that I, that I kind of am able to process what uh, that, what that experience was really all about. Um, but at the time, man, you're just a kid being a kid, uh, which I think is cool for those kids that they, that they build this environment that really lets you do that. Right, you have your interviews, you have your, you know, your your TV stuff, uh, which is all well and good. Um, but they really spend a lot of time making sure that it is fun uh, and engaging, and that you are still just kids there to play baseball, to play a game. Um, and so that I think is really kind of the magic of Williamsport. That's cool. And I see when you were younger in like high school and stuff. Uh... then or i think football or track um and i throw track in the mix because i i gave up baseball for football i always thought i was going to be like growing up uh, you know after you know before the league world series and then after it too i my passion was football or was baseball and so i always kind of thought that that's what i was going to do uh so getting to high school and really kind of learning oh i'd like to hit people more than I like to hit balls uh, made, you know, made that transition pretty easy. But football was always, I had the most fun uh, at football in the games, Um, but like track practice for us as a thrower, track practice is very, very or was at the top, right? There's no, we didn't, we we had a guy named uh, named, uh, Erpelding, Tim Erpelding, who was a coach and there was no running. Um, The, there was virtually no lifting. Uh, you know, he was, uh, most of our coaches were like volunteer guys. The runners coaches knew what they were doing, but like our practices, this is what made it fun. Cause again, I'm a high school kid, right? I, my, my focus is very narrow. Um, and so from day to day, I was like, you'd go to track practice and we'd throw for half an hour. And then coach Repelling would bust out his portable grill. Uh, and we'd throw down some burgers and some brats and let the smoke waft across the field, which is where the, the long distance runners uh, when they got done from like their five mile run or whatever, they'd have to run through our, uh, through our grill smoke uh, to get back <laughs> to the track. And we thought that was hilarious. Like that, you know, that was like, okay, you know, the, the quintessential. Your audio cut out again. Um, 
Shoot. Am I back now? I can see you in here. So, maybe. I can see you in here. Okay. There we go. Okay. So at least one person can see me in here, which is good. Um, but yeah, that for me was the quintessential high school experience. Um, you know, football was, first of all, we were terrible at football. I was very, very good throwers, two time state champion in shot put. Uh, football, we won uh, like three games in four years. Our high school football team was hot garbage. Um, so the fact that we had, you know, two, two guys play in the NFL, like I think four total guys play in college, um, you know, it was, we had talent. Um, our track team was stacked. We had athletes coming out of our bus. Uh, we just couldn't put it together on the football field, which was very, it was a frustrating experience, but I was so singularly focused on the potential of being an Iowa Hawkeye, which had been my dream since I was, you know, eight years old, um, that oh, yeah. I was willing to put up with just about anything, uh, you know, to, for that opportunity. Do you often get to go to an Iowa Hawkeye game every now and then? Yeah. Every now and then. I mean, I still, uh, we live an hour away from the stadium. Um, okay. You know, we moved back to here, moved back home to Davenport, Iowa after uh, the NFL career was over. Um, so this is where we're raising our family and it's uh, you know, a 45 minute drive from Iowa city and uh, the roads are a little bit crowded on game days, but uh, you know, if you can find parking, man, it's uh, it's a hell of a time. If you guys ever get a chance to come on out. Yeah. Cause I think it's honestly the, the best new tradition in all of football, honestly, the, the, the way wave, to the, yeah. the, the children's hospital across the street. I think that's the, like the coolest like new tradition that's been introduced and you see, all of these new football players like going and visiting these kids who are mm -hmm. like fighting for their lives and like deserve to be celebrated the way that they do. And like you see these great young men that are coming through college that are making time for these kids where they need that glimmer of happiness in a span of the most dis difficult part in their lives. So, I mean, that's... Yep. That's, I think, the, the best part about seeing Iowa and seeing a lot of Big Ten games 